That's the best kind of introduction there is. I'd rather have a bad introduction that you don't have to live up to. Um, <laughs> anyway, I always enjoy being here. I really do. I thank God for the privilege of fellowship with your pastors and with Mark DuPont and many of you. Let's pray together. We're so privileged, Lord, to, to be your servants and your children in this world, in this place. We, uh, we owe everything. We ask you, Lord, to, in your grace, your goodness and mercy, to breathe on us, remind us of your word, the word spoken by the prophets, the apostles, by our Lord. Incarnate in us all that your word wants to do in us. And I pray that uh, we will impart more uh, nature and character than mere knowledge. And help us, Lord, to reflect it in our world, our culture. God us, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles and would like to turn with me to the book of Proverbs, a proverb is a short statement about a long experience. Anyway, I love the book, Proverbs 18.24. In a moment, I'm going to um, read from Luke, the 22nd chapter. I want to talk to you this morning about friendship and pray that God will help me to be clear um, I'll read Proverbs 18, 24, just one verse. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. I like to say it this way. A man who has friends must himself be a friend. Friendship draws friendship. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend. I want you to say that with me. There is a friend who sticks closer. Let's say it together. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. How many of you know that friend? Amen. Well, and I want to read from Luke 22. I travel a fair amount like Mark, and I, I don't often get to take communion because I'm not in a local body doing that. And um, so I invited a few friends of mine to, uh, to receive communion with me. I was, I, was, um, I was impressed by the difference, and I appreciate churches giving communion, but I was impressed by the difference it made in my perspective by just having a few friends. And I read these verses, and I'll, I'll, I won't read the whole communion section. I'll just read these two verses. They struck me. Verse 14, Luke 22. When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles. Or they sat down, the twelve apostles, with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. A lot can be said about this text. The whole Passover thing, Jesus is the fulfillment of it, the Lamb of God that uh, caused the death angel to pass over us, the fulfillment of hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecy. But what struck me was in the hour of his trial, he wanted to be with his friends. With fervent desire, now that's it's hard to put into words when, when the Son of God says, I really wanted to be with you tonight. The disciples didn't fully comprehend. They did later. God is a social being. Jesus was a social being. He was unique, distinctive, but he had friends. He 
was a friend. He is a friend. Friends are those that you really want to be with, with fervent desire. Friends are those you miss <clears throat> when they're not there, especially if you're used to having them at an appointed time. Um, my first, I started pastoring <clears throat> uh, in 1957. I actually had been an interim pastor before the 1957 I um, became pastor in my first full-time church, first full-time pastor. And um, I was 20 years old, and of course I wasn't ready, but uh, God is good. How many of you know God is good? And um, anyway, I pastored seven years and ran completely out of what grace I had. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was crying. You're laughing, but I was crying. I thought, Lord God, I'm quitting. I am quitting. I told you it wasn't going to work in the first place. And, uh, you know, that's good. God just lets you run right out of steam. And somebody began to slip me some material on the Holy Spirit. A lot of different thoughts came together. And a friend of mine got baptized in the Spirit. And so I asked God to fill me with the Spirit and baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And He did. I often tell people... Prior to being baptized in the Spirit, I couldn't get a sermon out of the Gospel of John. <laughs> it's true. After being baptized in the Spirit, I could preach out of the index. And uh, <laughs> I was uh, ready to go, fired up. And, of course, uh, when I came back uh, and preached to my congregation and God began to move, everybody got excited. Even those that left were excited. And uh, they spread that excitement all over that part of the world. And uh, we had an interesting time, and we were the first charismatic church in our part of the country. Um, Southern Baptist, too. And that excited our association. Um, so I got to sit before committees. That's different than fellowship, although they did call it the fellowship committee. Anyway, <laughs> what a misnomer. Anyway, uh, the church changed, and it grew, and we touched all kinds of people, and it was wonderful. Seven more years, 14 years altogether. And the Lord um, led me to, to, to go to another area and enter into a little bit more broad ministry, and I love that church. It was special. My first pastorate, it's where so many wonderful things happened, and, um, and I moved all 700 miles away, and I, I noticed several things. When I got away from the church and its membership, there were certain people that I missed. I missed a lot of things, and I, lo I think I loved all the people as best I could. You know, it was my job, and, um, and, and I did. I loved the experience. In fact, I was no longer pastoring when I moved, and Every Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, I wanted to go stand behind a piece of furniture somewhere. I just, uh, <laughs> I missed it. Um, but I realized that I had friends, and I missed my friends. Um, and I stayed in touch and later moved back uh, into the general area about 40 miles away. Friends are those you miss when they're not there. I read a story that affected me, touched me, uh, oh, two or three months ago. Some of you may have read it. I don't know where I read it. But it's a story about an athletic kid in high school walking home from school, and he looked across the road, and walking on the same direction was a, a young man who wasn't at all athletic, and he was carrying a huge pile of books. He thought about going over and helping the, the kid, but he didn't. And then some guys came running down the street and knocked all his books out in the road, and he, he turned around, the athletic kid went over and helped him then. And he picked up books and uh, even carried some of them. And as they walked along, found out that they lived in the same general neighborhood, and to cut to the chase, Different as they were, uh, they became best friends over the course of the next weeks and months. 
the athletic guy invited the young man over to his house and they would toss the ball and, and uh, they became best friends. A year later, the athletic kid got a scholarship to play college football. The other kid had become valedictorian of the class. And it was time for him to make his valedictory speech. He was nervous. His athletic friend patted him on the shoulder and said, hey, don't worry, it's going to be fine. The valedictorian got up and thanked his teachers, um, thanked his parents. And then he said, the real reason I'm here today is because of a friend. He said, you see, I had cleaned out my locker because I didn't want my parents to have to do that. And I was on my way home that weekend to do the unthinkable. No one knew that story. A friend <clears throat> saved his life. The friend didn't even know it. You never know when you become a friend uh, what difference you might make. It could be all the difference. It could be an eternal difference. God is a social being. He created us for fellowship. The Bible says he made Adam in his image so they could have fellowship. Imagine God who conceived the galaxies from the minutest to the most magnificent. Um, condescending to men of low estate. But he made Adam so he could fellowship with him. Spirit, soul, and body. And the Bible says they walked together in the cool of the day. I don't know how God appeared, but Adam knew him. And they, I, we don't know how long they walked because the scripture doesn't say, but I would imagine it was quite a while because they had a lot to talk about. You see, Adam didn't know anything, and God was mentoring him about creation and naming the animals and everything he needed to know. And this was a regular occurrence every evening. And one day, God showed up, and Adam didn't. And God said, Adam, where are you? He said, uh, we hid ourselves, he and his companion. We hid ourselves. They were ashamed. God, being his friend, shed innocent blood to cover his shame. And it wouldn't be the last time God shed innocent blood to cover a sinner's shame. God continued, in spite of man's betrayal, to, uh, to have fellowship because God himself loves companionship. Enoch, the Bible says, Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God for 300 years, the Bible says. My father was a minister. I love to hear him talk about Enoch. And God. And he would say it like this. He would say that one day Enoch and God were taking an exceptionally long walk out through creation. It was just creation. And they were discussing the things that God wanted to talk about, that Enoch wanted to talk about. And then God said to him, Enoch, it's closer to my house than it is to yours. Come go home with me. And Enoch was not, for God took him. What a trip. What a walk. And then the Bible says that Noah walked with God. <clears throat> I'm sure he, he knew the Enoch story. That's how we got it. One day Noah was walking with God, and, and God said, Noah, <clears throat> um, I want to tell you something. And... Um, I want to save you from judgment. It's coming because God is a righteous God and the earth is full of wickedness and they haven't repented and, and uh, you are walking righteously and I want to uh, save your life and your family. 
you're, you're a good father and good husband and they love you and I want to save you. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, he said, no, I want you to build a ship 450 feet long. See, it's going to be a flood. What's a flood, Lord? It never had rained. It, a mist came up from the earth and watered it. He said, well, there are tons of water there over your head, and it's been protecting you from the uh, sun's uh, ultraviolet rays, and then there's a lot of water under your feet, and, and so all that water's coming down, and all that water's coming out, and it's going to be really nasty. And um, so I want you to build a ship um, 450 feet long in your front yard. And uh, now he hadn't heard of a flood. He, he, he hadn't heard of rain. And I don't know if he'd ever seen a ship or not. And I appreciate that he must have had a good relationship with his wife because I'd like to have a recording of that conversation <laughs> when he went home and told Mrs. Noah, well, dear... <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking to God again, and, <clears throat> and we're going to build a ship. And she said, well, is anybody else going to be building one? No, just us. Um, anyway. Friends are people you confide in. You, you would say things to that you wouldn't say to everybody else, unless, of course, you're on Facebook. Anyway, um, <laughs> I didn't, that wasn't anointed, just take that out, I'm sorry. Uh, Adam walked with God, Enoch walked with God, Noah walked with God, Abraham was a friend of God. James 2 says, Abraham was a friend of God, they had a special relationship. The Bible says in Genesis 15 that God made a covenant, in, in the Hebrew mind, Friend was a covenant word. We, we use it real loosely. I, you know, I friended somebody. I, I de defriended somebody. It keeps coming up. Anyway, um, um, but in, in the Hebrew mind, it was a covenant word. You see, the way God made a covenant with Abraham, he, he instructed him to flay certain animals, and there was a trail of blood between the parts. It was a commitment of life for life. They were being joined. To forfeit the covenant would be to forfeit your life in their minds. Now, Abraham, by the way, didn't walk between the pieces. God did. It was God's covenant with Abraham. I don't know why God chooses some people. I was asked that many years ago, and I've never answered it. I don't know how. But anyway, he chose Abraham. Maybe it was because Romans 4, Abraham believed God. And God considered him righteous because of it. But Abraham became such a friend that in Genesis 18, when God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, can I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? In other words, God said, I can't do anything this major without telling my friend about it. He was a covenant friend. David was a friend. You know, something that strikes me about these people is none of them are perfect. Um, I think we have the idea, if, you, if you're going to be a friend of God, you, you're going to be exceptional. Well, being a friend of God is what makes you exceptional. <clears throat> and God, you know, God um, made a covenant of salt, the Bible says, with David. 2 Chronicles 13, 5. David's great-grandson is reminding an enemy that the kingdom belonged to David's seed because God made a covenant of salt. Now, when we talk about salt, we usually talk about salt as a preservative, and it is. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor or flavor, it's like sand, and it's scattered and trodden underfoot of man. When things don't hold together, they become defeated. But he said, you're salt. When I was about uh, nine, I guess, I was given a job. Our, our, our neighbor uh, had a cattle farm next door, and uh, I was given a job of keeping the salt block out. 
and a trough, a tub of water for the cattle. They'd come, lick the salt, and drink the water. Salt was healthy for them, made them drink, and so forth. And I observed something at that age about salt. You, you put the salt block out, the cows would lick on it, and it could rain on it. It could get hot. It could get cold. It held together. Um, it's amazing. It would hold together till the, the cows just licked it away. It was cohesive. It wouldn't come apart. God made a covenant of salt with David. They were, they were tight. They were friends. Jesus called disciples. But they weren't particularly religious or even righteous. Some of them were commercial fishermen. I'm related to commercial fishermen. They don't know bad language is bad. <laughs> um, Peter, Jesus was on the beach and he, he said, uh, he got in the boat, he said, let's cast out. And Peter said, <laughs> Reverend, um, we've been fishing all night and I know you mean well, but there's no fish. And Jesus said, no, go on and do it. So he said, okay, it's your word, I will. And he went out and they got a boatload of fish. And he looked at Jesus in a new way. He said, get out of my boat. I'm a sinful man. You see, the popular concept is that holy people can't be around sinners. And sinners are not welcome with holy people. And that was Peter's idea. And those were the kind of guys Jesus called. Matthew, he was a crook. Um... Thomas, <laughs> he had trouble believing anything, and so forth. And Jesus was with them three years, and his friendship changed them. And one day Jesus said, I co call you no longer servants, because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I call you friends. Because everything the fathers told me, I told you. Imagine that. You are no longer just servants. They were servants, but no more. You're my friends. And he said, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat with you before I suffer. He wanted to be with them. There's something in that relationship. Rich and powerful as it was, they still went to sleep in the world's most important prayer meeting. <laughs> On the night of his trial, they all fled but one. But he forgave them. When he rose again, he cooked breakfast for them on the shores of Galilee and said, do you love me? And they said, yes. All that to me is very amazing, that God who made everything is a social being. He wants friends. It's not God that's hiding. It's Adam and his kids. But more amazing to me is that... <clears throat> He loved to be with sinners. He didn't just uh, stay in the holy club. He loved to be with sinners. He got criticized for it. Uh, but he said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Um, he said, it's not the well that need a physician, but the sick. Um, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost when he went to dinner with Zacchaeus, who was a crook. And, of course, when he called Matthew, people's mouths fell open because Matthew was a hated tax collector, a crook. And then he had a party and called his friends. So one can only imagine who all was there. But there was Jesus. I don't know if the disciples were comfortable, but they were there because the Lord was there. 
he is called a friend of sinners. Uh, this is kind of a hard transition. Um, I grew up in rural South Alabama village where everybody knew who Noah was and David was and even the people in jail were premillennialists. Um, we all knew the book of Revelation and Daniel. Um, I say that somewhat lightly, but that's just about true. It was religious. There was one church in town. It was a Baptist church. My father was the pastor. Later, there was a Methodist church. We really kind of spread out a little bit there. And um, it was a, co a common culture. And uh, I don't think I ever met a drug addict. Uh, I didn't meet many alcoholics. I don't know if I, I met any, really. Yeah, I knew one. Um, it was, it was a pretty sheltered existence. And then I moved into the city when I began to pastor, and, and uh, it was suburban people. We, 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 uh, we, we had a nice suburban group, um, 50s and 60s ranch-style houses, and it was nice. Um, and when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wanted to, I wanted to break out. And, and reach sinners. Uh, I had reached a few sinners, but they were pretty good sinners to start with. Um, and so we, we invited David Wilkerson to our city, and we had the city auditorium full, and, and he preached. And after the meeting, a, a medical a, a doctor came up to me and said, look, maybe, maybe what you're talking about would help my brother-in-law. He's an addict. He's in really bad shape. Would you go see him? And uh, I was feeling, yeah, I would go see him. And the uh, Holy Spirit was moving in our congregation. We were reaching people that were coming out after dark and not much before. And um, people wore sunglasses at night. And I mean, this is Mobile, Alabama. This is a very conservative area in the 60s. And um, people that never went to church. It was exciting. Uh, I mean, we had a guy walk down the aisle, the center aisle, while the service was going on, a guru with his robe and his medallions, and sat right on the front row. It was the only place to sit. People were clapping their hands, and when they saw him coming down the aisle, their hands didn't meet. You know, it was just <laughs> kind of, and we had a lot of unusual things. Anyway, he said, would you visit him? I said, yes, I would, and I did. I went, it's kind of an old home in a downtown section, and um, his father let me in, and I went up long stairs, the, the back of the house, upstairs, and walked in the room, and there was a cord hanging down with a light bulb on it, and this guy was laying in the bed, hardly made a wrinkle in the sheet. And there were holes in the wall where he'd been shooting cockroaches off the wall with a pistol. And uh, there weren't any cockroaches on the wall or in the house, actually. But he saw him, and uh, we got acquainted. He had the filthiest mouth, and I'd heard filth, but he had the filthiest mouth. And, uh, but he got better, and I'd talk to him about the Lord. I'd go visit him, and one day, and he, he liked to order me around, and he didn't respect my clergy status. And one day he said, uh, I want you to take me somewhere. I said, okay. He said, let's go. And so... We went in the car, and he said, turn here and turn there, and we went in a really bad area. And he led me up the steps, front porch, this old, old house, and got up on the porch, and somebody slid a panel back on the door. Now, that should have been a clue to me, <laughs> but, um, and the guy behind the door was looking at me, and Eddie, the addict, said, he's all right. I thought, what do you mean I'm all right? You're the one that's not all right. I'm all right. But I realized in his world, he was all right, and I wasn't. I was in a different culture. They let me in because of Eddie. <laughs> and as soon as we got in, it was dark, and I was trying to get my eyes used to the dark, and Eddie disappeared up the stairs, and by the time I got my eyes used to the dark, 
I had two revelations. One is, this is a house of prostitution. And secondly, my car is parked out front. <laughs> um, and Eddie came down with this woman and said, tell her. Well, that time I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, tell her what? He said, tell her what you've been telling me. And I gave her the shortest presentation of the gospel that you have ever heard. <laughs> And we walked down the steps on the front porch. I said, Eddie, if you ever do that to me again, you're not going to die of drugs. <laughs> she did get saved and ran a house for ladies. <laughs> if you find yourself among sinners... There may not be some, there may not be a lot of understanding among some. Now, now Jesus wasn't cozy with sin, but he did love sinners. And that's how they became righteous. If he didn't love sinners, then sinners wouldn't have a chance. But because he loves them, they have amazing opportunities. God's not the one hiding. God's available. As a matter of fact, he's calling names. Where are you? <clears throat> I'm looking for you. I want to be your friend. If we follow Jesus, we will find those he's looking for. And we'll teach them something that they probably don't know. And that is, there is a friend who will stick closer than a brother. Amen.